diversity, equity, and inclusion myths often hijack the critical work needed to create change that allows organizations to benefit from the richness diversity brings. After all, the World Economic Council studies confirm that diverse organizations outperform their non-diverse peers by anywhere from 20 to 36 percent across a wide range of key performance metrics, including profitability, innovation, and decision-making. So what are these myths that are hurting the bottom line? Stay tuned and find out. This is Business Confidential Now with Hannah hassel Kelchner, helping you see business issues hiding in plain view that matter to your bottom line. Welcome to Business Confidential Now. I'm your host, Hannah hassel Kelchner, and I have another terrific guest for you today. He's James McKim. James is the founder and managing partner at Organizational Ignition, where he and his team help organizations improve their performance through aligning people, processes, and technology. He's also the author of The Diversity Factor, Igniting Superior Organizational Performance, what a great subtitle. I mean, who doesn't want to ignite superior performance? So let's get started and find out about these diversity, equity, and inclusion myths that are holding organizations back. Welcome to Business Confidential Now, James. Thank you very much, Hannah. Great to be here. Great to have you. You know, with so many studies and so much data quantifying the bottom line benefits of diversity, Please tell us about these diversity, equity, and inclusion myths that are keeping senior management from doing the smart thing. What are they? Well, there are a number of myths, and I will start with the myth that there is pure social justice reason for paying attention to this and doing this work, and that social justice reason business goals and objectives. And so with that, the data that you mentioned that I have in the book just shows that that's not really the only reason that we should be focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's because of the benefits to the organization's bottom line that we should be focusing on this very important issue and this very important set of resources and tools that an organization has. Another myth that we see in, and this is particular in nonprofit organizations is that, well, we're a mission-driven organization, so we carry our commitment to fairness and equality in our ongoing work. And while the, 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 the commitment is probably there or the thinking is that the, the mission may have embedded in it this notion of dealing with diversity, it's one thing to, to think about diversity and be committed to it. It's another thing to know how to actually go about doing it. So I did some work with the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits where we surveyed the nonprofits from across the state. And interestingly enough, probably about 70 or so percent of them said that they really understood how to deal with and how to leverage diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it was because they said, well, we're a mission-driven organization, so we, our focus is diversity. But some of the other questions we asked them really got us to understand that that was merely a response from what they knew and from what they thought their mission was. When it came to the answers to the questions about how they actually implemented diversity, equity, and inclusion, or what tools they used, it was quite obvious that they didn't really know how to, to, to really embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's a, another one of those myths that we're a mission-driven organization and, and we, we deal with it uh, every day. Um, another myth that I hear is, and this is particularly in the more rural areas or um, non-big city parts of the state where they're, of the, the nation, uh, where there are not many people of color. And so th they say, you know, we just don't have enough, enough uh, we're predominantly white area, we don't have enough diversity, they use that term, we don't have enough diversity to really worry about it. So to that I say, well, let's define the, the term diversity. And I really love the definition that Marilyn Loden from Johns Hopkins Institute, actually when she was at Johns Hopkins Institute in 1991, uh, came up with that she referred to as the diversity wheel. And she says that diversity is really about personality characteristics 
And she said there are primary characteristics of our personalities that are characteristics that don't change over our lifetimes and it's how we identify ourselves internally. So our age, we're born on a certain day and that day is never, never going to change. While we will grow, we're always born on that same day. So we have the, the same early influences as we've matured. Our, our race doesn't change. Our, our gender does not change, although these days our gender can change, but if it does, it's going to change once in our lifetimes. It's not going to change multiple times. So that's pretty, pretty stable, and it's, it's how we identify our, ourselves. So there are these primary characteristics that we talk about, that she talks about, that define uh, our personality and define uh, diversity. And then there are these secondary characteristics that have to do more with how we interact with the rest of the world. So uh, what is our religion? What do we practice? What are our habits? Uh, what's our socioeconomic status? What's our marital status? Um, so those, those things that uh, have to do with how we interact with and how we're seen by the rest of the world are those secondary characteristics that make up our personalities. Uh, and then uh, Garden Schwartz and Rao, Lee Garden Schwartz and Chris Rao in 2007 came up with a third uh, kind of tertiary set of characteristics, or they use the term dimensions. And that's all about how we interact in an organization. So what function do we perform in, in an organization? Are we part of marketing? Are we part of sales? Are we part of research and development? Are we part of HR? So what's our function in the organization? Uh, and what's our seniority in the organization? Are we uh, uh, new to the organization or have we been around for a while? Uh, are we management or individual contributors? So what... The, the base concept that uh, Marilyn Loden came up with is diversity is really about these personality characteristics. And so to have diversity means you have people with these different personality characteristics, not just black people, not just women, which is what diversity sometimes is used to refer to. So this notion that because you don't have a lot of racial diversity, that you don't have diversity or can't tap into diversity, that's, a, that's, that's the myth. And the power comes in an organization where you have different perspectives. And those different perspectives come from people with different personality characteristics. So that myth of, well, we can't really deal with diversity because we're only in a place where they're whites, that's a myth. That's, a, that's not really realistic. Gosh, there's several others I could keep going on, but I, I want to, this is a conversation. So I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are about what I've said so far. We can add others as we go. I love the way you, you talk about diversity being a set of characteristics and not, not just the, the, the visual ones that people associate with, you know, the, the race, the gender, things that are just obvious in that regard, because it really does go to the decision making when you talk about different perspectives that people, you know, can bring to the party and, and how they can actually have more informed decision making as a result of that. One thing else that you mentioned that really piques my curiosity is when you're talking about the the nonprofit, you know, having the commitment, but not knowing how to implement, you know. So could you elaborate a little bit about the kinds of action and tools or technology even that might be available to help people put these good intentions into action? Sure. So one of the first things that I generally recommend an organization do is if you don't have one already, form a diversity committee. And that diversity committee, and you can call it a diversity committee, you can call it a diversity equity and inclusion committee, you can call it a, 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 that's a DEI committee, you can call it a diversity equity and inclusion and belonging committee, uh, you can call it, a, some people use the term JEDI for justice, equity, uh, diversity and inclusion, call it whatever you want, but it's that focus on making sure you have um, diversity in your organization that is treated and treated equitably and inclusively. So that's one of the first things I recommend organizations do is think about who your stakeholders are and then to create a committee that includes representation from all of those stakeholders. And that's the inclusion piece <laughs> it really helps there. Another kind of short 
uh, low-hanging fruit, if you will, that an organization could do is to have everyone learn about the basic terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Just define those terms so everyone in the organization knows what they are and use the language in the same way. Agree on the definitions of the terms that you're using. And this kind of comes from my background. I, I, I got a degree in philosophy, and in philosophy they teach us, you know, define things before you start talking about them. And sometimes it helps also to define what something is not to better understand what it is. So getting some training or, or reading up on those terms, those definitions, is another something that you can, can do uh, very easily. Um, an, another uh, thing that I try to tell organizations that is a low-hanging fruit is to think about what it means to be an inclusive leader. And Jennifer Brown has written a great book called How to Become an Inclusive Leader. And she talks about leadership an inclusive leadership development continuum. And understanding this continuum, understanding how we learn about things is so important and so easy. It doesn't cost anything, which, by the way, is another myth that we hear. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is too expensive for us to really engage in. And so forming a committee is not expensive. Um, learning about how to be inclusive is not expensive. You go by... Uh, Jennifer Brown's book and read it, and you start to understand how to be inclusive, going from the unaware stage, which where, which is where you don't really understand this diversity thing and why people are paying attention to it, or if you are paying attention to it, you're only doing so because you're trying to follow here in the United States the EEOC guidelines, and you're being compliant to um, creating an atmosphere where people don't feel like they're being discriminated against. You move from that unaware stage to an aware stage where you are aware of the issues around diversity, equity, inclusion, or at least that there are issues, and you know that you want to learn more. And there are plenty of books out there, including mine, where you can start getting some of that education. And also education about how to be a good leader. And we make this distinction between leadership and management, right? Leadership is how is knowing how to motivate people in a way that's not necessarily coercive, not the, necessarily the command and control method. Right? So becoming aware that there is diversity and there's a value to it is next. And that leads to once you've learned enough and understood a, a few ways that you can include people, like if a woman makes a suggestion during a meeting and a male recounts that suggestion as if it were his own, you as an inclusive leader can say, oh, Jenny, the woman who made the suggestion, made a great suggestion, and I like the fact, John, that you picked up on. So we're becoming allies to those who may not be normally heard or may have been just overridden in conversations. So that's when we're becoming active as leaders, actually taking action to be inclusive and equitable. And the last stage that uh, Jennifer talks about is being an advocate. And that's where we start looking at our systems, looking to see where systems are discriminatory or where systems are not inclusive. So we look at our policies and procedures and ask ourselves, are there roadblocks to people who are not white and male from getting their jobs done? So examining policies and procedures doesn't cost you anything. It costs a little bit of time. But if you truly want to be inclusive, your policies and procedures need to be inclusive and they need to be equitable. So you need to look at those. So those are a few things that I would suggest are very easy to do that can be implemented to increase your level of diversity, equity, and inclusion in your organization. All very good suggestions. Thank you for that. What about the a smaller business, a smaller mid-sized business that that really doesn't have among their ranks enough diverse individuals to compose a committee. Let's say it's pretty homogeneous. 
and they know they need to start doing more. They maybe don't fall under the EEOC guidelines yet and because of the size of the organization, but they know that they want to grow and they know that they need to kind of change their mindset and have a growth mindset, you know, be willing to yeah. learn. They're not quite sure where to start. And coupled with that, it's going to be kind of a two-part question for you, James, is, okay, so let's say it's an old boy network, all right? So it's homogeneous in terms of its composition. You, know, you, you don't have any women working there. You don't have people of color. They know that, that they look pretty silly in today's age to do all of that. They want to change that. By the same token, they're afraid. They don't know how change will affect them. Yeah. What advice do you have for an organization that's kind of, you know, they got one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat and they know the boat's going to pull away, but they don't want to get wet. Well, you just articulated another, I would say, reason why organizations don't move into this, right? Because they're afraid of what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen. They're so used to being in control that they don't want to lose that control. So I'd say, first of all, don't be afraid to lose that control. Uh, this is this stems from the command and control management style that I just mentioned before, right? Mm-hmm. So I understand that you cannot control everything and reach out to the community that you're in and find those diverse organizations that, and talked before about stakeholders. Even if you're an all white male employed organization, employee organization, you're probably operating in in a city or a location or uh, if you're selling products, you're selling products to people who are probably not just in your local community. So you have stakeholders who are not just people in your community. You have customers, you have suppliers. So reach out to them and identify what we refer to as an accountability partner someone who can bring those different perspectives to your organization. And you're not employing them, but back to the notion of a diversity committee. When I talk about forming diversity committees, I don't mean just of people inside your organization because stakeholders are people outside your organizations too. Stakeholders are anyone who has a stake in the success of your organization. So you may have suppliers who have a real stake in the success of your organization. Your customers have a stake in the success of your organization. Make them part of your committee. Get their perspectives. Ask them, how should we include those people who are not like us? And with that accountability committee, it it could be a women's group, the women in engineering, for example. It could be uh, Asian American society. Uh, It could be lovers of the environment. So reach out to those groups and ask them, say, we want to become more diverse. We recognize that we're not. We recognize that we're all white males. We're in this this old buddy network, more or less, and we want to break out and we need help. Just recognizing and, and sharing with everyone that you need help. People want to help you. People will want to help you become more diverse and a better organization because you're expressing that that desire. That's great to think outside your immediate group of employees and the other stakeholders, because they certainly want you to stay in business if if you're supplying them, if they're your customers. So definitely, definitely. That's some great advice. Appreciate that, James. As we're going to close here, what do you think is the most important thing you want your listeners to know about diversity, equity, and inclusion myths? Well, I, I think we, we kind of touched on it, and you mentioned the growth mindset, and I love that from Carol Dweck's work at Stanford University. It's so important to have that growth mindset, to recognize you don't know everything, and to take that into everything you, you, you do. The, from the myth perspective, it, the myth is that it's hard. <laughs> and in one sense, it is difficult. I guess you should say difficult, not hard. It's difficult. It is work that needs to be done. But... It's work that is worth the effort. It's work that will help you to um, improve your organizational performance. And when we, we talk about organizational performance, when I, I use Universalia's definition of the balance between effectiveness, efficiency, relevance, and financial viability. And we most, most people think when they hear organizational performance, well, do they 
are they profitable? But it's, it's more than just the profitability. So that, I guess, is kind of another myth that, that I, I'd like for people to, to walk away from understanding is not necessarily the case. So look at your organization from the perspective of how can we improve its performance and recognize that diversity, equity, and inclusion helps with that aspect on top of it being a socially justice, social justice uh, right thing to do. Excellent. It's the smart thing to do in order to thrive going into the future. And I so appreciate your time, James, and, you know, sharing information about this important work about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you're listening and you'd like more information about James McKim, his work and his book, The Diversity Factor, Igniting Superior Organizational Performance. Those links can be found in the show notes at businessconfidentialradio.com. And if you know someone whose organization is struggling with diversity, equity, or inclusion, the whole belonging idea, they could benefit from his advice or his book, please tell them about this podcast episode. Share the link, leave a positive review so others can learn too. You can do it on your podcast app, or come on over to lovethepodcast.com forward slash Business Confidential because you have been listening to Business Confidential now with Hannah Hassel-Kelchner. I hope you have a great day and an even better, more inclusive, more diverse tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.